Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is the last of the three sessions, and it's going to be conducted by Dr. Naveen Kinney, who is a pediatrician with over 28 years of experience, and he has been my pediat pediatrician for over 16 years. Today, he will be talking to us about burns, choking, diarrhea, and CPR. Thank you, Anika, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Naveen Kinney. I'm a pediatrician in Bengaluru. I'm the tail end batsman in this limited over series of on first aid. Our opening batsman was Dr. Satish Kinney uh, two weeks ago when he spoke about um, heart attacks. He spoke about hypoglycemia. He spoke about wheezing and COVID-19. And then last week we had another master batting performance by Dr. Boparna, who went into the basics of first aid. He told us about elements of first aid, the DRABC of first aid, and then spoke to us about first aid with um, um, how to handle stroke, um, seizures, how to handle falls and fainting. And so now it's my turn. I'm coming into bat and going to talk to you about diarrhea, burns, choking and CPR. All of you waiting there with your questions, please remember it is considered rude and unsportsmanly to bowl bouncers at tail end batsmen. I'm just joking. Please feel free to ask any doubt that you have, however silly or irrelevant you think. Just type it into the chat box and we will try our best to answer them. Of course, if it's a very nasty bouncer, we're just going to tuck. So, coming to the first topic of mine. Diarrhea. Diarrhea is defined as the increase in the frequency and fluidity of stools in comparison to a person's usual bowel habits. Why is prevention of diarrhea important? Let me put out some statistics. This is from the WHO data. It's one of the leading cause of death in children under the age of five years. Each year, about half a million children die of diarrhea. Globally, there are about 1.7 billion cases of diarrhea, childhood diarrhea. And if you add the adults to that, it comes to close to 2.5 billion cases of diarrhea. So a lot of people sitting a lot of time on the potty. Diarrhea is a leading cause of malnutrition in children above the age of five years. And traveler's diarrhea is one of the predictable travel-related illnesses affecting about 30 to 70% of travelers. What causes diarrhea? Before I go to that, let me go to my first slide. Let me give a brief introduction into the digestive system of the human beings. All the food that we eat gets into the food pipe called the esophagus and then gets in the stomach where it mixes with the stomach juices, the gastric acid, and then enters the intestines. They have about 23 feet of the small intestine and about five feet of the large intestine. The small intestine that constitutes the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. Basically, this is where all the digestion of the food occurs. So all the food is mixed with the digestive juices that come from the liver and from the pancreas. And a lot of fluid is there in the small intestine, which helps in the digestion of almost all the fluid, all the food that we eat. So finally, the digested food enters the colon. Here we have the ascending transverse and the descending colon. The main job of the colon is to absorb fluid from these digestive juices back into the bloodstream. And what is left in the colon is basically the undigested matter, that is the um, fiber on which the bacteria have their meal. They create a lot of important substances for us, include, including vitamins. And finally, the waste comes down to the rectum as feces. And when it's culturally appropriate, it is released by the relaxation of the anal sphincter. So now let's see what causes diarrhea. Diarrhea can be caused by an increased secretion of fluid into the intestine. For, uh, due to a variety of stimuli, the intestine secretes more fluid into, the, into itself than usual. It's usually caused by toxins. Commonly, an uh, example I can give is uh, cholera or even food poisoning. It literally is like a tap opening into the 
into the uh, intestine. Probably the the reason behind that phrase tap is open. The second reason we can get diarrhea is because of osmotic osmotic diarrhea. This is this happens when large molecules reach the colon without being digested. It usually happens in lactose intolerance. So these large molecules withhold the fluid and prevents its absorption. So the stool remains fluid and is watery, and that's that's one of the causes of diarrhea. Rapid passage of stools through the intestine. This is usually called motility-related diarrhea. It's usually seen in irritable bowel syndrome. And inflammatory diarrhea caused by infections is usually a combination of two or sometimes all three of these causes. Diarrhea can be classified based on its duration into acute, persistent, and chronic. I'm going to be dealing with only acute diarrhea for the reason of this discussion. It's diarrhea which usually lasts one or two days or sometimes up to a week or two. What are the common causes of diarrhea? Most commonly, infection can be bacterial, viral, or parasitic. Drugs, commonly antibiotics like amoxicillin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen, antihypertensives like almisatan, Food poisoning is a common cause caused by what are called ETEC, enterotoxigenic E. coli or Clostridium. It can be caused by the toxin which is already present in the food or the toxin gets produced inside our body after ingestion. Causes a very, usually causes a very watery diarrhea. Allergies and intolerances to certain foods commonly again, like I mentioned, lactose intolerance. Gluten intolerance in celiac disease is also a cause of um, diarrhea. And of course, stress. I very commonly see it in adolescents before their exams. And of course, even adults before a, maybe an um, important meeting, a board meeting or a appraisal in the company. So, what do you do when you have diarrhea? Diarrhea, according to me, is something which is the most one of the most over-treated conditions. Most cases of diarrhea clear up without any treatment. We must understand that diarrhea is a protective mechanism of the body. Just like when you have an irritation in the throat, you cough. When you have an irritation in the nose, you sneeze. Similarly, diarrhea is a way of the body's way of pushing out the irritant. So there's nothing much you need to do just that, than to go and sit on the pot more often. Unfortunately, it's over-treated. Sometimes we doctors are guilty too. The most important thing is to avoid self-medication. I'd like to narrate an incident. I was at the medical shop below my clinic and um, a person walks up there and says, Sir, lose motion agi de, only antibiotic kodi. I think I should tell this in Kannada because there may be people who uh, don't know Kannada. I should tell this in English. So he walks up and says, Sir, I have loose motion. Give me a good antibiotic. This chemist doesn't know where to look because I'm standing right there. He says, no, 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 I don't give these things without a prescription. Go get a prescription. And that fellow immediately says, no, no, no. What you gave last time worked beautifully. Give me the same antibiotic. So that is the level of, you know, over prescription and over, uh, you know, the ease at which people can get antibiotics and medications in India. This is something all of us should avoid. All you have to do is drink plenty of liquids. You can drink things like tender coconut water. You can drink electral. You can drink some soups with a little bit of salt, buttermilk with a little bit of salt. One thing I should warn people here is that there is a popular drink called ORSL. ORS is the short form for oral rehydration solution. I'm not sure why this is being allowed to call ORSL because it is nothing close to ORS. There is only one particular product in that lineage called ORSL Re Rehydrate, which is the WHO formula. The rest of all, rest of them are all sugary drinks, which will worsen your diarrhea. So be careful what you go and buy from the medical shop in the name of ORS. Solid food as tolerated. In the Indian contest, you can use idli, rice ganji, rava ganji, curd rice, etc. The Western world has what is called the brat diet, bananas, rice, apple sauce, and toast. It's quite good for pediatric diarrhea. Sometimes adults try their own version of brat diet, especially when they are told to drink plenty of liquids. 
they go in on a binge of brandy, rum, ales, and tequila. I can assure you, it'll land you. It is very likely to land you up in hospital rather than get you better. So, alcohol is an absolute no-no when you have diarrhea. Infants should continue to breastfeed. Of course, we say in older children to reduce the milk intake a little because there usually is some amount of temporary lactose intolerance. So, milk can be withheld. And strict hand hygiene and social distancing applies to this too because these diarrheal infections, especially the viral diarrhea, the stomach flu as it is called, is extremely contagious. So, sending a child with diarrhea to a daycare center is not at all the right thing to do. When do you see your doctor? You see a doctor when your diarrhea is particularly frequent or severe, when you have six to eight loose stools, especially large volume loose stools. In condition like rotavirus diarrhea, in a small child, five loose stools can make a child severely dehydrated. As even in adults, when you pass large volume stools, you can get dehydrated very easily. Blood in the stools with a foul smell, this usually is an indication of an infection, especially if there's stomach pain. So you need to go see your doctor. Persistent vomiting. If there is persistent vomiting, no amount of oral medication is going to help because it's going to come out immediately. So you need to probably go and get an injection and if required, IV fluids. Severe and continuous stomach pain. Diarrhea can be a manifestation of a surgical condition in the stomach, especially things like appendicitis or diverticulitis. So if you have stomach pain and diarrhea, go see a doctor. And of course, when you have signs of dehydration, things like you know extreme thirst, significant weight loss, um, very dry and parched tongue, the reduction of tears, you feeling very tired, very weak, etc. These are signs of dehydration when you went to go and see your doctor immediately. How can you prevent diarrhea? Watch what you eat and drink. I know it's very tempting when you see that Pani Puri Gadi to go and have one plate of Pani Puri. But remember, you get diarrhea and worm infestations free along with that. Get vaccinated, especially in the extremes of age and before travel. Rotavirus, diarrhea and cholera are two eminently preventable diseases, preventable by vaccination. Stop storing food and eat mostly fresh food especially the older generation, they don't like to throw food. So they keep it in their fridge for, you know, sometimes days together and sometimes even forget about it. And after some time, they, they don't like to waste it. So they think they'll finish it. But I think we should, we should refrain from this. If the food is more than two or three days old, discard it, don't eat it because you can get food poisoning. Good hygiene habits. This goes without saying, particularly hand washing before each meal. Um, one thing I would like to stress is in children, see that you cut their nails because a lot of germs can be below the fingernails, which can sometimes be missed. And this can lead to repeated infections in children. And adequate breastfeeding. This is something I cannot stress more. This seems to be a misconception, especially after the child has crossed the age of one, that breastfeeding is not required that the child will not eat if the child is breastfed, etc. That is absolutely wrong. It is the current recommendation of the World Health Organization to breastfeed all children till the minimum of two years or longer if the mother is still comfortable. This prevents many infections in the child, especially gastroenteritis, that is diarrhea. It also gives protection to the mother against many illnesses, including breast cancer. So it should be a strong reason why women should breastfeed till the age of two. So, I finish my first part of the talk. I seem to be reasonably on time. Let me get down to the next topic, that is burn injury. Burns are defined as injuries that result from direct contact or exposure to any physical, thermal, chemical, electrical or radiation source. How common are burn injuries in India? Unfortunately, very common. We have about 7 million burn injuries, burn cases annually. Over a million people are moderately to severely burnt every year. It's a lot of people. 
almost a lakh and 40,000 people die of burns every year. If you see this graph on the left, the most cases of burns are in the, in the very productive age group, 15 to 35 years. And majority of them are women and children. And as many as 80% of them are from preventable accidents that occur in the kitchen. So a little bit of care in the kitchen can prevent 80% of this 1 million, 80 lakh cases. So all the more important that you listen to the prevention aspect very carefully. How do burn injuries occur? The most commonest types of burns are the thermal burns, those caused by heat. They can be caused by dry heat, that is either a fire on an electric iron, or sometimes can be caused by something wet, that is hot water, steam or oil. It's also called a scald. They can also be caused by friction. Those of you who run long distance will be very familiar with the, the um, what do you call it, the chafing of the thighs or even the nipple bleeding after a marathon or a half marathon. It can be co caused by cold or frostbite. Frostbite is a kind of burn. Electrical currents. This includes even lightning. Lightning is one of the most severe forms of electrical burns you can get. Radiation like the one that occurred in Chernobyl and also sunlight. Sunburn is a very common cause of burn. And of course, chemicals, it can be both acids as well as alkalis, strong acids and alkalis. Where do burns generally occur? Most commonly, like I said, in the kitchen, followed by other areas of the house, like the bathroom, living room and outdoors. Other factors that contribute to burns are occupation. If the, most of you, if you have been to Srinagar and been to the Dal Lake, you can rest assured that almost Every person who takes you on that um, Shikara ride or any photographer who comes to take your photographs is almost completely sunburned because the sun is not very hot there. So they tend to stand in the sun, but those rays are very dangerous. There's a very high incidence of skin cancer in them. Age, extremes of age, of course, are always prone to burns. Habits, smokers, definitely. And especially if it is combined with heavy drinking, the chance of you burning yourself and your house down is very high. Social factors, the more primitive the area, the more, you know, the primitive, the thinking, the more the incidence of burns, the chemical burns like acid injuries. And long-standing diabetics are particularly prone to burn injury because of a condition called diabetic uh, neuropathy which reduces the sensation in their extremities. And so it takes a long time to realize for them to realize that they're getting burnt. And so by the time they realize it, a lot of injury has occurred. So the degree of burn is more in diabetics. So talking about the degree of burns, if you see the normal skin, we have two layers called the epidermis and the dermis. A burn that involves the only the epidermis, the top layer is called a first degree burn. These are extremely painful, but they heal without scarring. They last about a week. The second degree burn is a burn which extends a little bit into the dermis, not completely, but a little bit into the second layer, the dermis. So these are, these generally have pain, redness, swelling, and blistering. They're also called partial thickness burns. A third degree burn has burned through both layers of the skin and into a part of the underlying what is called the subcutaneous tissue. So this usually is associated with extensive scarring later on. And these burns can be less painful or even painless because even the nerves of the skin are destroyed with this kind of burns. There also is a third, the fourth category called the fourth degree burn, wherein in addition to the subcutaneous tissue, the underlying tissue like muscle and sometimes even the bone is damaged. This is, these are very severe forms of burns. So what do you do when someone has a burn injury? First, you have to cool the burn. Keep that area under running water for a minimum period of 15 minutes, preferably up to 30, uh, 20 minutes at a temperature of 20 to 28 degrees. That is the running water in our Indian taps. 
take care not to use ice cold water because that can cut off the skin supply to the the blood supply to the skin and hinder with the heat exchange do not break small blisters they form natural protection against the infection but if you have large blisters we may have to you know put a syringe inside aspirate the fluid and uh, if they are open we may need to dress the blister remove rings and tight items immediately this is very important because burnt areas swell up very fast so if you don't remove these things then you, you may have to cut them off and they can cause constriction injury so remove the rings and tight items and also if possible keep the burnt part at a level higher than the heart so that the swelling that occurs is a little less than what it would be if it was below the heart so always remember to elevate that portion of the of the body which has got burnt apply a lotion you can apply just an aloe vera gel or if you feel that it is a it's go, likely to get infected you can use what is called a um, silver sulfidizing cream but remember the cream application has to occur only after the cooling after the 15 20 minutes of cooling only then you can apply the cream most burn injuries are best left alone but some large injuries or very you know injuries which are very likely to get in contact with dust and mud can be bandaged the large injuries anyway have to be bandaged while bandaging you have to remember to use what is called a, a lubricated gauze as a first layer and then dress it up with bandage so that while removing it is less painful and nothing sticks to the wound pain reliever can be used generally paracetamol if it's severe you can use ibuprofen or something even stronger this is something very important this is something which we tend to forget especially burns in small children and burns on large areas you can lose a lot of heat right from the burn and plus from the fact that you are uncovered so prevent heat loss otherwise you can land up with hypothermia what do you do if your clothes catch fire this is this is a common scenario first thing is to stop do not panic and run because panic fuels the flames you know when you run the flames get uh, bigger next cover yourself heat rises so you need to protect the delicate skin of the face your eyes your eyelids etc and also prevent inhalation of the smoke which can damage your respiratory tract and the oral cavity so cover your face immediately drop to the ground and roll backwards and forwards on the flame by rolling backwards and forwards you deprive the flame of oxygen so it cannot burn so the flame is put off if you do have a bystander with you you can the bystander can help you by pouring water on you or covering you with a flame resistant rug or even beating the flame out of you but remember a fire extinguisher other than water cannot be used on the human body they are very good for putting out the fire in the house but this cannot be used on the human body because they stick to the body and will help to you know keep the heat inside and so that increases the amount of damage that occurs so no fire extinguishers to be used on the body but you can use it on the rest of the fire in the house what are the burns that require a visit to the hospital large and deep burns a large burn is a burn which is more than 1% of the body surface area so a rough estimate is the size of your palm your palm is considered 1% of the body surface area anything more than 1% of the body surface area requires a doctor to look at it anything more than 9 to 10% of the body surface area in a child or more than 10 to 15% of the body surface area requires a specialized burn unit and admission and iv fluids because they can lose a lot of fluids and go into de dehydration very fast so you need to go to immediately get admitted to hospital all chemical and electrical burns because there is a potential for you know scarring burns that cause white and charred skin usually are third degree burns burns on the face hands genitalia feet and legs because these are exposed areas so we need more specialized care to see that the scarring is minimal and the cosmetic effect is less and burns inside the mouth and respiratory tract because 
these areas tend to swell up and compromise with either swallowing or breathing how do you prevent burns keep the kids out of the kitchen at hectic times older children can be told about the importance of not coming near fire move all handles towards the center of the stove this is such a temptation for that little one there so to just pull it down and pour everything on himself so move it away from the uh, center of the stove move uh, move it towards the center of the stove away from an area where it can be reached let the food cool in the microwave before taking it out this is very important especially if you are letting children handle food and if you have anything covered in the microwave open the cover away from you so that if any steam escapes it doesn't come onto your face avoid loose and loose fitting and easily flammable dresses while cooking especially sarees loose sarees you have to be very careful i'm sure you have remember this scene in mrs doubtfire with robin williams in outside the kitchen set water temp water heaters to 50 degrees children so your newborn should be bathed with just lukewarm water and not the kit kitty water that our grandmothers used to use have child proof electrical switches this is very important you get the silicon um, covers for electrical switches keep matches light matches lighters and candles away for obvious reasons put away the electric iron after use humidifiers are not really recommended of course they are good for your cold but you know one of the commonest burn injuries i see is in small infants who put their hand and pull this towards them and pour the water over them and the mother encourage your child to play in the shade if they are going to be outside for a long time to avoid sunburn and of course if they are going to be in the sun use a, a sunscreen of an spf of more than 30 okay i still seem to be on time so it's okay i come to the third part of my talk this is see these two topics are essentially what we call demonstration topics we need to have a dummy and it has to be done live so i'm not sure how effective this will be virtually but i'm going to try my best choking is defined as a blockage of the upper airway by food or other objects which prevents a person from breathing effectively let me try and describe a little bit of the anatomy of the upper respiratory tract as you know we breathe in through the nose we eat in eat through the mouth all the food and the air comes into what is called the nasopharynx and from the nasopharynx we have two openings one is the opening of the trachea which is the opening of the respiratory tract through which we breathe and behind we have the opening of the esophagus or the food pipe through which the food passes if you take a section like this here through this this is what you see if you see it from behind this is called the epiglottis this is uh, and these are the cartilages of the vocal cord uh, of the larynx these are the vocal cords so this forms a nice niche for something to go and sit so an object like a grape can very nicely sit here and completely close the close the opening of the um, respiratory tract smaller objects tend to if they can pass through this um opening then they go and lodge themselves into the lungs they do not cause uh, emergency uh, difficulty in breathing but they can cause problems like pneumonias and they also have to be immediately removed so basically choking is food going the wrong way so we see this diagram the blue diagram is how the air passes the brown diagram is how the food passes so food no inadvertently uh, entering the airways yes, anika can you mute mute everyone please yes. so if you if the food inadvertently enters the airways it leads to choking what are the circumstances that choking can occur if normal swallowing mechanisms are slowed down especially if some adults follow the liquid brat diet very studiously or drug abuse is when your swallowing mechanism is slowed down children putting small objects in their mouths this especially what you see in this picture is an extremely common and extremely dangerous condition 
not only can they choke on the tablets these tablets usually they are anti hypertensives or anti diabetics can cause serious poisoning and hypoglycemia or hypotension that is low blood pressure in a small child you cannot underestimate the dexterity of those small fingers they almost invariably get that tablet out and put it in their mouth so be very careful when you you know to put away all your medications away from children when you have small children in the house advancing age and poorly fitting partial dentures um, i particularly mentioned partial dentures because these are the dentures that are the exact size which can go and lodge into the larynx when do you suspect that someone may be choking so in an adult you can see it adult coughing or gagging you can see panic signals hand signals and you can see the panic on their face the sudden inability to talk is a show of fire sign of choking and clutching of the test uh, clutching of the throat this is called the universal sign of choking if you see somebody doing this and having difficulty in talking or coughing you can rest assured that he is choking on something in children it's a little more difficult but it's a inability to cry or make sound or weak if ineffective coughing a child <coughs> that's all the child can do soft or high pitched sound while inhaling <laughs> that is all you can hear when the child is breathing and of course difficulty in breathing when you see the ribs and the chest retract that is when you have to suspect that the child is choking what do you do if someone is choking you first have to decide whether the obstruction is partial that is mild choking or complete that is severe choking in partial obstruction the airway is only partly blocked so the person is able to speak cry cough and breathe whereas in a complete obstruction where the in the obstruction the choking is severe the person will not be able to speak cry cough and breathe so this is an important differentiation that you have to make when you suspect if somebody is choking so what do you do for mild choking they usually will be able to clear the blockage on their own so all you need to do is encourage them to keep coughing ask them to spit out the object if it comes into their mouth do not put your finger in their mouth you can get your finger bitten off because they are in a state of panic so you can have serious injuries on your finger and more importantly do not give them anything to drink because in partial obstruction as as it is the airway is compromised you give them something to drink this can go and occupy the rest of the space and completely obstruct the airway and also go into the lungs and cause what is called aspiration pneumonia if coughing does not work then we start what are called back blows this is how you manage choking in a adult and a child over the age of 1 year you need to give five back blows how do you do that you stand behind them slightly to one side support the chest and bend them forwards give them five sharp blows between their shoulder blades with the heel of your hand and mind you it's not hitting like this it is a sharp you know blow with the heel of your hand so you have to do this and give them five blows between their shoulder blades with the heel of their hand check if the blockage is cleared if not proceed to what are called abdominal thrusts to carry out an abdominal thrust you need to again stand behind the person who is choking place your arms around their waist and bend them forwards clench a fist and place it right above the belly button of the person put your other hand on top of the fist on top of your fist and pull sharply inwards and upwards this is the kind of movement you have to do and repeat this movement up to 5 times okay so this is the kind of blow you have to give them so continue the five cycles of uh, continue the cycles of five black back blows or and five abdominal thrusts till help arrives if they lose consciousness and are not breathing you should begin cpr and chest compressions which i'm going to talk to you next in pregnant women and obese individuals abdominal thrust may not be possible because you may not be able to reach around their abdomen so you need to give them chest thrust the same method but you need to press it on the chest and you know 
give compressions on the chest. In very tall persons, you can make them sit on a chair like this, or in smaller children, you can kneel next to them and then give the abdominal thrust. What do you do in a baby who is less than one year old? <clears throat> do not perform these steps if the child is coughing forcefully and has a strong cry. A strong cry. That means this child is reasonably, you know, breathing reasonably well. So you just need to reach hospitals as early as possible and get that object out. But if you see the symptom that I mentioned earlier, a child who is limp, whose child is, has a weak cry, who is unable to breathe, has severe chest retractions, etc. Then you need to lay the infant face down along your forearm. Let me try and demonstrate this to you. By the way, this is Kushi, my daughter's soulmate, ex-soulmate. So, are you able to see this? Anika, am I visible? Um, could you move it a bit higher? Yeah. Higher? Yeah. Yeah? Can you see this now? Yes. Okay. So lay the infant face down on your forearm. The head should be lower. You can support the jaw with your fingers and give five quick forceful blows. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. You then, if the object isn't free after five blows, turn the child up. over. Uh, may I just interrupt? Can yeah. I request you to stop sharing your screen so that we okay. can see you better? Okay. And then you can share your screen I'll again. I will do that. Okay. Can you see me better now? Yes, I can see myself better. So, so hold the child upside down. Support the jaw, the face with your fingers. Hold the baby down so that if the object comes out, it falls out. And give five blows. These are called back blows. One, two, three, four, five. If the object is not out, turn the baby over like this. Again, keep the head low. Put your finger at the, on the chest, a little below the inter, inter nipple line in the center and give five what are called chest thrusts. One, two, three, four, five. So you need to go down to at least four centimeters or one and a half, uh, uh, one and a half inches. You can take the support of your thigh if you want uh, when you are doing this, so that you get a better, uh, you know, grip of the child. So change the leg when you are doing the other thing. So you continue a series of five back blows and five chest thrusts. One two, three, four, five, till the object comes out. And you do not put your finger in the mouth unless you see the object. Otherwise, there is a risk of you pushing it further inside. Okay. So, let me share my screen again. Visible? Yes. Okay. The next scenario, you are choking and you are alone. What do you do? Not the ideal situation to be in, but you can deliver a true self-abdominal thrust by positioning your hands in the same way and delivering an inward and upward thrust on yourself. Or the other option is to bend your belly over a firm object like the back of a chair and thrust yourself into the chair. Not very effective, but it's better than not, you know, not having, uh, not doing anything at all. How do you prevent choking? In children, keep young children away from hard food and small objects, especially toys which have detachable um, parts like a car with a, with a wheel, you know, which is detachable. That is extremely dangerous. Clean up properly after parties, especially balloons. These broken balloons can go inside and because of their elasticity can completely cover the larynx and seriously compromise with breathing. Cut fruits and grapes into small pieces. The grape is an ideal size to go and sit on the in the laryngeal opening. So you need to cut them. Not, I would suggest you cut even this into half. Avoid toys that have small objects that are sewed on, especially these kind of you know eyes. These threads tend to get loose and then 
you can rest assured that will be detached by the child and put inside the box. Do a visual sweep of the floor every day. That means you have to go down to their level, not do it from your level. What looks like a P to you will look like a football to the child. So you have to go down to their level and see. This is something you have to be particularly careful about. Button batteries, not only can they go into the lungs, even if they go into the stomach, these things can leak and the acid inside can corrode the stomach and cause what is called perforation. So if you suspect a battery being swallowed, you immediately have to go to hospital and get an x-ray. You Generally, they are visible on the x-ray, so they need to be removed. Do not allow children to play with food or gum in their mouth for obvious reasons. And encourage a child to take small bites. Generally, when they you know when they are feasting on something like a burger, they then they tend to chew more than they can swallow, and that can lead to choking. In adults, this is a dangerous combination, like I said, food and alcohol together. Be very careful. Avoid multitasking when you are doing something like combing your hair. If you are, you know having a pin in your mouth, talking on the phone and combing your hair, there's a chance that this pin can go inside. Eating competitions, according to me, is something very stupid. This is There is a limit to what your um, pharynx can hold and one of the commonest cause of choking is this. Senior citizens should regularly visit their dentist and make sure there are no loose dentures. Okay, now the final part of my talk cardiopulmonary resuscitation. CPR is an emergency life-saving procedure performed when the heart stops breathing. Cardio means heart, pulmonary means lung. Resuscitation, I would say, is um, reviving or helping. So what you basically do is keep the blood pumping so that the brain receives its you know, supply of blood and oxygen. So the brain is not damaged. So this, that is the basic idea of providing cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Why is learning CPR important? There are about 6 million sudden cardiac deaths that occur annually worldwide. And most of them occur due to a sudden irregular rhythm of the heart, what are called tachyarrhythmias. The heart starts beating chaotically. So there is no blood that is pumped to the heart. Sometimes the heart can even stop. CPR also may be required in, in victims of choking, drowning, electrocution and poisoning. And the, the reason why everybody should know CPR is that most such instances occur at home or work where there is no you know, access to specialty medical care. So you may not have even a what is called an AD device. So CPR is what keeps people alive. And CPR performed within the first six minutes of the heart stopping can keep someone alive till medical help arrives. The six minutes is important because six minutes is the maximum amount of time the brain can tolerate lack of oxygen. Anything more than that and then brain damage occurs. So later on, if you, you know, uh, revive the blood supply, there still will be some amount of brain damage. So that is why starting CPR, as soon as you see somebody, you know, in an unconscious state and not breathing properly is of utmost importance. How do you perform CPR? CPR needs to be performed in a particular order for it to be effective. Last Sunday, you heard Dr. Mutan, um, Dr. Bopanna speak about DRC, DRABC, D being look for danger, R, look for response in the patient, danger for both you and the patient. If there is obvious danger, move the patient to a safer locality. Look for response by talking, shaking, etc. Try to see if the person is responsive or not. And then, of course, airway, breathing and circulation. In CPR, especially after 2020 revision of the AHA guidelines, things have changed a little. Now, more, the first emphasis is on compression and restoring the circulation. So, compression is the most important part of CPR. Then comes the airway, that is opening of the airway and breathing. You breathe for the person. What are the types of cardiopulmonary resuscitation? We have, there are two types of 
CPR that can be performed. One is the conventional CPR, wherein you give chest thrust as well as mouth to mouth uh, resuscitation. And then what is called the hands only or the compression only CPR. In conventional CPR, you use chest compressions and mouth to mouth breathing, like I told. And they're given in a ratio of 30 compressions to two breaths. And this is recommended for people who are well trained and confident in their ability to perform the CPR. Whereas hands only CPR is just giving uninterrupted chest compressions without giving any rescue breaths. And these are meant for people who are not trained in CPR, who want to do something, but they don't know, they're not adequately trained or in the current scenario of coronavirus where people are worried about giving rescue breaths to the victims. And also for recommended for people who have taken CPR training long back, who are not confident of their abilities to perform the CPR. Why was hands only CPR introduced? It, it was found that it increases the chance of the bystander taking action in the, in the um, event of a cardiac emergency. So most people are, are um, what do you say, hesitant because they are scared of making a fool of themselves or causing damage to the person. But I can assure you, you can't have anything worse than being dead. So some amount of help or assistance is better than no assistance to a person who is not breathing and lying on the ground. It doubles or triples the cardiac arrest victim's chance of survival. And mind you, 90% of them die if you do not intervene. It can be performed correctly even by sixth graders. There was a study recently done where they found that sixth graders almost always found the correct spot and they gave the right amount of compression in CPR. So I think this is something which all schools in our country should explore teaching CPR to sixth graders and older children, because I'm sure a lot of lives can be saved by them because they are the ones who are very likely to be around in a house when a medical emergency like this occurs. Of course, hands only is not recommended for infants, children and victims of drowning and drug overdose and people who have had collapse due to say asthma. And it has been shown to be as effective as CPR with breaths in the first few minutes. This is quite relevant to our scenario because in a country like in most advanced countries, the help arrives within five minutes. So. Uh, giving only hands only CPR is good enough to keep the blood supply to the brain, oxygen filled blood supply to the brain. And by the time the emergency services arrive and take over, whereas it's not the case in our country where you have to probably even think of arranging an ambulance, shifting this person to the thing. So I would suggest we stick to conventional CPR in our country, especially if it occurs at home. So what are the steps of CPR? Compression, like I said, is the most important step. Let me try and demonstrate it to you as well as I can. So put that person on his or her back on a firm surface. This is very important. If they're lying on the bed, get them off the bed and onto the ground. The firm surface is important for you to give adequate depth of com uh, compression. Interlock your fingers, one hand on top of the other hand. Kneel next to the person's neck and shoulders and place your lower palm or heel of the hand over the center of the person's chest between the nipples. So this is how you need to place your thing. And keep your elbows locked in the sense they have to be tight like this. Don't keep it loose and position your shoulders directly above. So when you see on top, you need to be in this position directly. Your shoulders should be directly above the sternum or the breastbone of the victim. Push straight down or compress the chest for at least two inches or five centimeters. Push hard at a rate of 100 to 120 compressions per minute. So the recommended um, idea given is to Rest to the beat of a song and the, the recommended song is, I don't know how many of the youngsters know this, but it's Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. 
which has a beat of about 110 per minute. So you go push to the beat of that song. If you haven't been tra uh, trained in CPR, you continue chest compressions. If you have been trained in CPR, go to opening the airway and rescue breathing. Now, let me see if I can demonstrate this. Um, I'm going to assume, I want you to assume that my chair, chair is the person who is lying on the ground unconscious. This side is his head, this side is his body, this is his breast bone, uh, chest bone. So, I'm going to take the heel of my hand, keep it on the, um, the breast bone, the center of the chest of the person who is unconscious. Take my other hand, lock it here like this and pull it up a little. Why do you pull it up? Because sometimes in your enthusiasm, you can press on the other side also and break the ribs on the other side. So you pull your fingers up and you will see that only the heel touches the chest of the person. Stand above the person, lock your elbows like I am doing and stand above so that your shoulders are directly above the chest. I am sorry, you are not standing, you are kneeling on the ground. Here I am standing and then you go, ah, 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 staying alive, staying alive, ah, ah. or even the Beatles song. We are living in a yellow submarine, yellow submarine, yellow submarine. Probably you'll get your mind off the morbidity of what you're doing, but that is the beat you have to follow. You have to take care that you do not do this. By doing this, you get tired. You won't be able to sustain it for more than five minutes. So use your body weight. Keep your elbows locked. Use your body weight and do this. I go any further and I'll land up with a broken chair. But the depth that you have to go is about two inches or five centimeters. And continue to give 30 breaths continuously at that rate. I told you that is 100 to 120 uh, compressions a minute. Okay. Again, visible. So next we go to the airway. Once you give 30 compressions, the next thing you need to do is to open the airway by what is called the head tilt chin lift maneuver. So you place your palm on the person's forehead and gently push the head back. And then with your other hand, gently lift the chin forward up like this so that you open the airway. So if you can imagine yourself sniffing a rose, this is how you go to when you sniff a rose. So that is the position you have to have the victim's um, head in. So that opens the airway properly. And then what do you do? You check the mouth for any object. Check if they are breathing by positioning, positioning your ears above the person's nose and listen for breath sounds. And when you are listening at the same time, look at the chest. When you see the chest, look for the chest rising and falling. So if there is no movement, that means that person is not breathing. So then you have to breathe for the person. You do breathing by following by using the following steps after the head tilt chin lift, lift maneuver you pinch the nostrils shut and cover the person's mouth with yours making a seal and then give the first rescue breath lasting one second and then watch to see if the chest rises you need to blow into the mouth and watch for the chest rising if the chest rises give the second breath if the chest is not rising, you need to re-maneuver the head, repeat the head tilt and chin lift, chin lift maneuver and then give the second breath. Resume chest uh, compressions to restore blood flow. Remember, it's only two breaths. Don't go on giving more than two breaths. It's the chest compression is the important part of CPR. 30 chest compressions followed by two rescue breaths is con considered one cycle. In a child between eight 
uh, one and eight years, you use only one hand to compress the chest. You fold the other hand because if you use two hands, you may be putting too much pressure and you may break the ribs. Having two persons at hand makes CPR easier because then you, you can alternate because CPR can get tiring after some time, especially if you have to do it for more than 10 to 15 minutes. So if you have two persons helping you, you can alternate between breathing and uh, chest compression. So you continue CPR until there are signs of movement or emergency medical personnel take over. What do you do with an infant less than one year? Again, use only two fingers of the hand for chest compression, just below the line joining the nipples here and compress, compress up to one and a half inches. And while giving rescue breaths, cover both the nose and mouth with your mouth, not just the mouth, you have to cover both the nose and mouth. So on Kushi here, if you can see, she has to be on a you know, firm surface, not on your hand, like you are doing for choking. So it has to be on a firm surface and go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, up to 30. And then cover both the nose and mouth and give two rescue breaths and see if the chest is moving. So that is how we do it on an infant. What constitutes high quality CPR? See, to have maximum effectiveness, CPR has to sat satisfy five critical components. And I will tell you an incident like which I mentioned in, during the first talk also. I have a friend of mine who had a heart attack. He was taken to hospital and luckily for him, he was uh, transferred to Vikram Hospital in an ambulance which contained a doctor. On the way, he arrested and he was given CPR by the doctor. And after reaching the hospital, he was, he had no heartbeat for almost 30 minutes. They were about to declare him and, but the doctor insisted, that young doctor insisted that I want to continue for some more time. After 45 minutes, after repeated defibrillation, his heart rate came back. And because of the high quality of CPR provided by that <clears throat> young doctor, this person survived with absolutely no brain damage after being clinically dead for 45 minutes. So that is what I mean by high quality CPR. This person now goes for walks, he travels all over the countries, even traveled abroad. So because of the quality of CPR provided by that young doctor, that person is having a very good quality of life today. And this is what all of us should aim at. So that means minimum interruptions in chest compressions compressions of adequate depth and rate, rate of 100 to 120, depth of at least two inches in children and adults and one and a half inches in infants. You should avoid leaning on the victim between compressions because you have to allow the chest to open up so that the air fills in the lungs. Whatever air can fill will fill into the lungs and blood fills into the heart. When you press the blood is pumped out of the heart when you leave the blood from the lower extremities and other parts of the body enter the heart for it to be pumped again to the brain so do not lean on the victim between compressions proper hand placement is important if you place too high you don't press the heart if you press too low you may damage the abdominal organs like the liver and the spleen and avoid like i said excessive ventilation two breaths is more than enough concentrate more on the compressions than the breathing so to summarize, in adults, you use both hands interlocked between the nipples and uh, this is the area where you have to press. In children, one hand between nipples and in infants, two fingers just below the nipple line. You press down to two inches in adults and children and 1.5 inches in infants. 30 compressions at 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Allow the chest to recoil between compressions so that the heart fills with blood and then you press it again so that the blood is pumped out and immediately follow with rescue breaths, two rescue breaths for every 30 compressions. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Anika, it's a wonderful initiative that you've undertaken. I'm so proud of you and believe me. I am sure my fellow speakers will also agree. It has been as much a learning experience for me as I hope it is for you. We are 
um, thankful for the opportunity given and I am open to questions now. So the first question we have is, is there a tablet for diarrhea that can be kept in a first aid box at home? Uh, see, it depends on what the cause of diarrhea is. If you have a diarrhea which is due to increased motility, like is commonly seen in situations of stress, then you can use an anti-motility agent like Imodium. Um, Opramide is the drug name. But in Imodium. most cases, and especially in children, we do not recommend any kind of anti-motility agent to stop diarrhea. We need to get that toxin and the virus or bacteria flushed out. So you need to have ORS sachets in your first aid box more than anything else. Um, okay. Does teething cause diarrhea and how do we handle this? Um, you, the child doesn't develop diarrhea because of the teeth appearing, it is because during teething, the child puts everything and anything into the mouth. So, two things which I tell my parents, one, whatever goes to the child's hand should be clean and number two, bigger than the mouth. So, in this way, you prevent both infections as well as choking. So if you make sure that small things do not enter the, do not reach the child's hand, you can prevent choking in an infant to a large extent. But that said, one or two episodes of gastroenteritis is almost inevitable. There is no way you can keep your eye on a child 24 hours. So you are going to see an occasional chapel or something in the child's mouth and that can lead to gastroenteritis. How much electrolyte powder can be given to a 16-month-old? It depends on the amount of diarrhea. I would say about 100 to 150 ml per stool, depending on how the stool is. If it's not a very watery diarrhea, you should let the child decide, the thirst of the child decide. The child will take as much as the child wants, depending on the thirst. Um, do you get a lubricated gauze or do you have to use a lubricant before applying gauze? Lubricated gauze as the first layer. So you get medicated lubricated gauze now. So you keep that as the first layer and then do the dressing so that when you are removing it, nothing much yeah. sticks to the wound. Yeah. Is there a name for one of those gauzes that we can keep in a first aid box? Yeah, it's called, uh, there is one medicated gauze, I'm uh, suffused to me here, uh, it's called Sofratul. Yes. It's, it's Sofratul, it's, it's a tool means a T-U-L-L-E, -L -L -E. I think it's a French word for a bandaid, bandaid, uh, bandage with the holes in it, you know, and that is usually comes with the Sofromycin um, ointment, impregnated with it. If you have oxygen at home, can that be used as a substitute for CPR? You need a particular equipment called bag and mask ventilator to which you can connect the oxygen and then give breaths through that. But there is no substitute for chest compression. Oxygen will only provide the oxygen, but you need to get the blood pumping in the body. So you need to give chest compressions to keep the blood pumped and reaching the brain. And you have six minutes, remember. Six minutes is all the time you have after the person falls. Um, what can be kept in the first aid box at home? First, you can keep dressings. You can keep, um, like Dr. Satish Kini mentioned, soluble disprint in the event of a heart attack. You can keep paracetamol. You can keep... Uh, one drug which I forgot to mention are probiotics. They are reasonably safe and effective in watery diarrhea. So you can have a probiotic sachet like lactobacillus. Uh, available in your first aid kit. Um, you can have the Sofra tool and um, you can have a silver sulf sulfadiazine cream if you have any burns. That is, uh, it's called Silver X. Band-Aids, of course. Uh, the next question was, um, is it safe to perform CPR on someone who is choking? Um, see, you follow that particular, you know, order. You first try the um, what do you say, back blow and then you try the abdominal thrust 
but if that is not helpful and the person loses consciousness and stops breathing then you have no other choice but to provide cpr because if you don't do that very soon he'll go into cardiac arrest so you need to keep the heart pumping and try to get as much oxygen as possible into a person who is choking and who has not responded to your conventional measures there is another emergency measure which i didn't mention because it is it does it only buys you a little bit of time that is putting a wide bore needle into the trachea below the adam's apple so you need to have some knowledge of anatomy you need to put one or two wide bore needles right here in between the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage so that will allow some amount of air to enter if it's a very severe choking but then it's very likely to get blocked because there's going to be a lot of bleeding so it's only a temporary measure but it can buy you a few minutes or till you reach hospital but that is not the recommended thing so that is why i have not mentioned it how do you know someone is responding to cpr that person will start to talk will start to cough more effectively will start to breathe more effectively you may see the object come out or sometimes they swallow the object by cpr of course the person will slowly start regaining consciousness because his hearts will start beating and so the blood supply to the brain is restored so he will regain consciousness he'll start breathing on his own so if he starts breathing on his own then you need not give rescue breaths and if you see him regain consciousness if you can feel a carotid pulse if you can feel a pulse here that means his heart is beating effectively then you can stop chest compressions also but you need to transfer them to a medical facility as early as possible um if a small child sleeps with their fingers in their mouth can it cause choking choking is caused by detachable objects a finger is not a detachable object so a finger cannot cause choking when the child can't breathe he'll bring the finger out